Welcome to Lord John Lander, the Outlander podcast for Lord John fans, where we talk all things Outlander, but especially about Jamie and his Sassanac. And sometimes we talk about Claire, too. We can't promise you much, but for the next half hour-ish, we can promise chaos and to make you question whatever life choices led you to listen to us. Before we get into it, this is your one and only warning that show and book spoilers are lurking around every corner. We're even going to spoil crap that never happened. Hello, welcome to Lord John Lander. We are your hosts. I'm Mistress Pandora, but you can call me Pan. That's kind of a mouthful. And my co-host, Beth, is here as well. Say hi, Beth. Hello, everybody. And today is a very, very special episode because we have our very first guest host, and that is Ness. You guys know her as Geek in the Pink on AO3. Ness, you want to say hi? Hi, everybody. Happy to be here. I'm so excited. We're so excited you're here. So we are going to go through episode 105. This is Rent. Um, This is a fantastically, like, Dougal-heavy episode. We really wanted Ness on because she has some of the best Dougal takes ever. Um, And I really don't think that we're going to get through this in half an hour. So we may have to, this may end up being, (laughs) this is probably going to be a two-parter. But that's okay. Make it work. Yeah. There's just a lot in this episode, and um, I, I mean, it's just so much is revealed about the characters, and just a lot to unpack. Yeah, so much content, so much plot, really, so much characterization. And we all have very strong feelings about Strong it. opinions. <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> So I don't think that we had anything to clarify or correct from last week. So we are going to just skip that part. And if we did, oh, well. (laughs) Maybe we'll get to it next time. Maybe not. Maybe we won't. Maybe it just never actually happened. Who knows? (laughs) It will just remain a mystery. Or you can Google it yourself. (laughs) Google it. It's fine. You send us a message on Tumblr, I guess, or Twitter. if If you want, I guess. That'd be, that would be a fun segment. <laughs> Messages from Twitter and Tumblr. <laughs> oh, that, that really would be. Like, yeah. I would love. I think, didn't they do that on the um, Outcasts podcast? Yeah, that sounds familiar. Like the I fan think they might have done that. that. Yeah, we should. So, guys, send send us your questions and comments. Um, we are not reading their streets. Hot takes. <laughs> Yeah, hot takes, nice things. Yeah, we um, love a hot we take. do. I mean, we we record well in advance, though. So you may send us something and then have no idea, and then just <laughs> magically be surprised. Later. Yes, six six weeks later, like, oh hey, I forgot I did that. Um, but yeah, It'd so be a surprise for everyone, <laughs> us included. <laughs> 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 In a month, we're going to get emails and go, what the hell is this? Mm-hmm. Who is it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> we did We did open our mouths on that one, didn't we? Mm-hmm. Oops. All right. So, Rent. We've got Claire is getting on the road with Dougal and Jamie, who she still thinks is McTavish. Rupert Ankus, all of our faves. And this episode opens up with Claire quoting John Donne at the lock. And this is where she meets Ned Gowan. (gasps) Oh, Ned. Oh, so exciting. We we stand Ned. We totally stand Ned. Love Ned. Pansexual icon, 100%. (laughs) Like, Ned is a guy who will try anything twice. Um, (laughs) (laughs) He... I just, you know who he'd get along really well with is Harry Quarry. Mm. Oh, that's a good one. The other, the um, other pansexual icon. Yeah, oh my God, that's a show. ship I've never thought of. Jeez. Oh, gross. Uh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> I thought I like went through all the crazy uh, chaotic ships, but no, there, there's one. All right, I'm write that one down. <laughs> <laughs> the thick will be coming. No. Yeah, oh, God. <laughs> 
Yeah, I don't think we, I don't, I don't think that we need a fic for that, but you know, sometimes we don't need it, but when we get it, we, we find out that we really did. So yeah, exactly. you, just, you just never know. Well, we I didn't... always thought, I always thought Ned and Lamb would be like Ooh. a really good pairing too. Like I always kind of have wanted them in, especially in like a modern AU to like oh. meet each other and, and, you know, kind of like be oh. old man boyfriends and yeah. stuff. Yeah. Cause they both love Claire and they like take and her they're... under her wing while the other men are being mean to her. Oh my God, you guys, I'm having a moment. I need this <laughs> oh, so no. bad. I didn't. Oh, that is real I... sweet though. I'm like, I'm, that's so endearing. Well, and they're both like, so like gen, they're like, Gentle, mild yeah. mannered mm-hmm. but they're they're mild mannered but they're also adventurous yeah worldly and um they're so both intellectuals mm-hmm. um i mean they'd be the cutest oh, i do love I it. Need yeah, this I so much, guys. <laughs> i did not need another otp but here we go okay yeah yeah pretty much <laughs> though ned deserves one let's be real he does. i can't believe we haven't thought of one for ned yet like this yeah. is necessary here we are so I mean, Ned is Ned and Claire kind of they have like a little bit of a I mean they have a nice little start in the beginning, but through the episode they're there having kind of their ups and downs, um, and a lot of it has to do with Claire being really infuriating um, <laughs> most of this episode. The whole episode. Um, but he's also like. Most of it, he's like kind of mildly amused mm-hmm. by by her um, being so like self righteous and stuff. It's not till later that he's kind of like enough is enough. But anyway, yeah. we'll get there. We'll get there. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting with him because um, I kind of feel similarly to him that I do to Jamie in this episode because he's like. Um, it seems like he's genuinely interested in talking to Claire, getting to know Claire, like spent whatever, spending some time with her. But yet he has this very distinct loyalty to the hi- the other Highlanders. And so you, you got like the push and pull between that this whole episode. I was like, I, it's funny because I don't think I thought about it until this rewatch. But I was like, um, you got these two kind of men who seem to be like, for Claire at least, uh, at least like we just met met in this episode. But um, yeah, it seemed to go back and forth between like, are we on her side? Are we on the side of the other Highlanders? It's interesting. I think that's kind of Claire, though. Like, that, that sounds like a Claire problem in this. Oh, easily. Yes, yeah. <laughs> she, like, she pushes it too far, as she does. Yeah, she does. She's just, and she's working off, like, just assumption upon assumption yeah. upon assumption. Like, right there, you know, she has her little moment with Ned Gowan, but, like, then, you know, very early on in the episode, um, the guys are all uh, talking, joking around, um, and they're in. They're speaking in Gaelic, and her instinct is that they're they're speaking in Gaelic deliberately to exclude her, and yeah. that's so, so. I mean, it's their first language. Yeah, that it I is it too, was... because it's in. Um, uh, oh my god. When she speaks over top of it, oh my god, I can't remember what it's called. Um, in the the voiceover, voiceover. Oh my gosh, thank you. So, and because she says it in the voiceover, it's like she's stating fact, and you're like, uh, she would be like, unreliable narrator, unreliable narrator. It's not. How do you know? You just are saying that out loud. Like that's not this. You never asked anybody. You never asked them. <laughs> You ever well, asked and, Jamie who might could who could maybe well yeah and then he even comes over and tries to explain like it's so dumb. <laughs> and it's funny because she says it like it's fact. Mm-hmm. Like I I think like you know I've watched the shows and rewatched them, watched them and stuff, and you know read the books and then just spent so much time thinking about these characters. And it was a little while before I myself was like you know she's wrong (laughs) like they that is their primary language and the fact that they've been speaking english around her generally is actually a courtesy to her yes um thousand percent because why would they otherwise speak anything but gallic Mm -hmm. especially where they are it's not like they're in london yeah exactly yeah Yeah. um we kind of see that in the last episode we didn't really 
touch on this at all, but when Myrta is translating for her at the gathering, he gets shushed. Yes. Of course, mm. he just kind of scowls at her. Um, like, like, fuck you. I'm going to do what I want. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. Well, that's Myrta. Yeah, that's that's Myrta. God, I love Myrta. This is a good Which, Myrta it's episode, interesting too, but I'm getting ahead of ourselves. That does happen at the beginning of the episode, too, right? So that kind of sets the scene for the whole episode. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, they're against me. So then it's like, is she making conflict out of nothing? She started yeah. that. She came to be angry. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, and I think, and and I do think she has some justification in being oh, angry, sure. right? Like, yeah. you know, she, it, she's just been kind of, <laughs> first of all, she's been outwitted by them, <laughs> like at every right. turn mm-hmm. and she's trapped and now she's like stuck on the road with them. Although, and I think because she's hoping that she's going to be able to find Crane of Dune. Yeah, she's um, like single minded about that. She's like, that's her main yeah. focus. Her mind is always there. And I think because, I, I mean, I don't think they've, no, because they wouldn't have talked about this yet in this show. But if, I always wonder, like, oh, is it because of her glass face that, that I believe Jamie uh, says that about her, that because she has a single minded focus on something that she doesn't want them to know, that they know that she's lying the whole time. So, of course, they don't trust her. Like, you know, what, like, does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I mean, they never really go into the glass face on the show, but at all, but oh, like, okay. well, I'm just, I'm just, I thought it was at least somewhere, but maybe it is. I, but no, I generally don't it's, remember. It's kind of visual. It's visual. <laughs> yeah. True. Yeah. 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 I mean, she's, she's definitely walking around. My, my mom would say <laughs> like a, with a puss on her face. <laughs> <laughs> That's cute. But, um, Yes, she's got a chip on her shoulder. She's mm-hmm. just and what now that she's so singularly focused, I think it's making her even angrier that she hasn't quite gotten to that goal yet, you know? So mm-hmm. she's just, you know, more and more mad. And then yeah, it's she's looking for things to be pissed off about. Um and we see that and the men don't take to that very well. Especially no. a pair of, well, no, especially Angus obviously, which we'll see later on, which was which it went against intense. I'm so excited to talk about Angus. Me too. I have well, so many thoughts. I have so many back and forth thoughts about so many things in this episode. <laughs> Claire is so infuriating, yes. But then it's like, of course, at that moment, once again, we'll talk about it when we get to it. But it's like, I can't help but, like Beth was saying, there's moments where I'm like, yeah, they treat her so terribly. <laughs> like, I, it's, it's, back, it's both. It's somehow both. And here, she does not have any female buffers. Right, like None. at Leoc, she's she's got Mrs. Fitz especially, who just thinks that she like walks on water. Uh-huh. Um, and then, but even like you have to think in the day to day, like there's just other women around to be buffers. But now it's like she is in a hundred percent in like testosterone city, like in this close is, quarters too. Yeah, and this is this is their thing. It's just you know they're, you know, of course they're gonna sit around, you know, the fire telling dirty jokes. Like mm-hmm. usually, there's not a woman with them. yeah that they need to worry about and all that. Yeah. But just, okay, can I just say too? This is the only time I noticed this when I watched it last night. Was she was like their lewd jokes didn't upset me. They're this, and I'm like, you're clearly so upset saying that. <laughs> like, are you sure you're not upset, Claire? Are you sure? Because your voice sounds upset. I'm just like, you're such a liar. You think thou dost protest too much. Like, talk about glass face, now you get a glass voice. Like, come on. Uh, oh, that's yeah. It was funny. <clears throat> yeah, and like you said, you know, Jamie does try to reach out to her. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, say, don't worry about it. And, you know, they don't hate you. They just don't trust you. They don't but know you though. Do you think it's fair? Yeah. It, it, to her, it's one in the same, which is True. interesting. Yeah, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, it's very immature point of view, right? Like, you know, oh, when you're like... thinking. It feels very yeah. stereotypical, stereotypically female as well. Like, oh, they don't like me. I'm thinking like a woman from the 40s and something too. Like she's very, obviously she's very independent. She's educated. She's lived all over the world. 
But is she falling into the trap of, oh, they don't like me? Yeah, and, and that that kind of, it's just a very, you know, immature way of thinking. You think about, like, you know, the typical, like, junior high friendship. Mm-hmm. It's like, well, we had a fight, so now we're not friends anymore. You know, like. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. Because yeah. she goes, because she's so flippity floppity with mm-hmm. Rupert and Angus. Obviously, Rupert is the one who is more kind of, like, jovial. And I think you see less conflict with him. He's got his own issues on the other, like on the other side of that. But, um, but that her specifically with them, I couldn't help but like dive into their relationship so much when I was thinking about the episode, because it's always she hates they hate her and she hates them, or vice versa, or they're like oh they're so sweet and they're such a strange little like threesome da, 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 like they can't be every episode and sometimes every scene it changes. Yeah. Well. And some of that, I think, might come from the fact that, you know, in the book, neither of them are very big characters. And they're mm. certainly not the, like, um, you know, uh, the comedic foil characters that they mm-hmm. are in the show. Right. So you can kind of see a little bit of a wobbly ground when they're trying to build these characters out of nothing. Yeah. Yeah, and it's funny because I found other things like that in this episode as well, being kind of like, oh, that's weird for that character, or that's weird for that kind of storytelling. So it's kind of that's kind of interesting. This episode is interesting for that kind of theme in general, actually. This is the first episode that really has kind of a, I don't want to say truncated, but it has a narrower cast than the mm-hmm. previous episodes because the previous episodes were at Leox, so the column was there, and Mrs. Fitz was there, and everybody else, Galus was there. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there was a lot more. There's a lot more to pull from. And, but I mean, somehow they did manage to get all of this characterization and get all of this conflict crammed into this hour. Mm-hmm. And funny enough, like, I, I, it is one of my favorite episodes. You know what? I feel like I'm complaining about it constantly, but it, it is, is actually, I find it's it a very, very good episode. Sometimes that's like the best way, though. I mean, it, yeah. especially when you think about kind of almost the build up, right? or I don't know, build up, build down, I don't know. But, you know, this one gets them narrowed down into this core group. And then um, the next episode is a, is basically a bottle episode. Yeah. Um, and that really gets to the heart of some of the characters. And so. then even yeah. Seven, you could say, is like at least half a bottle episode and half something totally different. So, yeah. Absolutely. Like, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, totally. It's interesting, too, because... Um, the other yeah another thing that I was focusing on this episode is how different characters I think I probably said it already I'm already forgetting but um how different characters uh, react when they're in different groups of people and this is like the perfect this is essentially the perfect episode for that because I think it happens with just except for, it, oh no because even Claire with the women is happier <laughs> so even she has yeah. it but everyone in this episode acts differently depending on who they're, who they're with and it actually drove me insane like I started to be like what I started to doubt things that I thought I knew about the characters so well that I was like, oh, but look at them, like, the way they act in this episode. I feel like I haven't, rather I hadn't seen them act like that at all before or after. Or it was just, I'd so little, like, I'd seen so little of it, like, except for this one. I think that makes this a really important episode for that Mm -hmm. reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree. It is. It's, this is, this, in the next two episodes, so five, six, and seven, I think are you know, the most, some of the most important episodes of the entire series. Mm-hmm. And they really, you know, sometimes when I try to tell people they should watch Outlander and they're like, oh, I gave up after episode two or something. I'm like, you have to at least get to episode five. Like you mm-hmm. have to get yeah. to episode five or else you're not getting I almost feel the... like you, you'll find a character that you um, are rooting for by episode five too. Yes. Yeah. Um, and so the first kind of, um, conflict that we see here in this episode is, you know, they arrive at one little village, um, group of tenants, whatever you want to call it. And, um, Claire kind of starts to get to see the rent collecting in action. And we see Dougal, um, as, you know, all we've seen Dougal so far has been like uh, kind of brooding or 
suspicious. Yeah. But in this episode, we see the magnanimous, you know, Mm -hmm. pseudo Laird, right? Mm -hmm. And he's shooting the shit with everyone and, you know, beloved by his tenants and stuff, or by tenants that he, um, that he has to connect with because obviously Colin doesn't do it. So, yeah. Um, and it kind of goes back to, um, what we were talking about for episode four about loyalty. And cause we talked a little bit about the different types of loyalty that we saw in the gathering, but now we're also mm-hmm. seeing this, this loyalty to the clan amongst the tenants that are playing or that are paying rent. Um, right. And kind of getting to see Dougal in that type of situation. So I, one of the things that I, I noticed, so I, this was, I think the first time I'd actually rewatched this episode all the way through. So the first time I watched it, obviously I was like brand new to the fandom was still trying to figure out who everyone was, what the dynamic was, what, what was going on. Right. But now coming back to it after having a solid two years of developing really strong opinions about (laughs) all of these people, um, it's almost kind of trippy to see Dougal in that good guy light. Mm. Like it was kind of, it, it made me feel a little weird. Cause I'm like, I know what's coming. And I'm like, I'm getting, I'm getting myself worked up already to be mad at him for things that haven't even happened on the screen yet. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm curious. Okay. So you guys keep talking about that, about the first time. Uh, and it is the first time he's magnanimous. It's the first um, long stretch of time that you see him um make i guess make good decisions i guess you could you could say and <laughs> like you could see genuine him genuinely wanting to help people here and there throughout the episode but um what always sticks with me as the google as the google oh my god as the Google stan that i am <laughs> um is is it the end of castle Yuck where he's playing with um spoiler alert his son and claire's looking at them and like um and it's funny because I I've watched, rewatched that scene uh, several times, and she she's very she's she's like enjoying seeing the play, and she obviously doesn't know the big secret about um, the parentage and all that. But um, uh, there like you kind of don't know how she feels about it as far as uh, Dougal goes because he's he's even done some things like before that that I think would maybe make her afraid of him and things like that. But it's so. That's always a scene where I go, oh, it's so interesting that so early on in the season, you, like, I th- I just think that scene is so adorable, and so, I just can't, I remember thinking, I don't know, probably during one of my re- rewatches where I was paying very close attention, very, play, paying very close attention, being like, this seems like a clue that he's actually a good guy. He's like, oh, look at him, and he, like, cherishes these moments with this kid and his nephew slash nephew slash son because <laughs> i think i think it is maybe it is like trick of the tr- to trick the audience of like oh look at him he's so sweet to this kid how can he be such a bad guy and i definitely i know i definitely like um fed into that of course until i think it is the gathering when he <laughs> stops her in the hallway and he's wasted and then you're like that, that's just the first thing i think of as far as um one of his first um really bad behaviors uh come into uh Claire's knowledge, at least. You know, I don't well, think that he was initially like. I don't think the intent was for him to be this big bad villain. So, so I'm yeah, he's I'm curious what you're really not about that. Written, like. He's really not written as the villain. He's written as a complicated character. He's written as a source of significant conflict later Ooh, on. Speak my language, but. <laughs> but He's, I mean, he's really not, for all of the awful things that he does, um, he's not really written to be the villain. The villain in this season is clearly Blackjack. Mm-hmm. Agreed. Yeah. Well, and I think too, you know, he is highly villainized in the fandom, generally yes. speaking, yeah. I think. But like, there's, I've I think always. The reasons. Yeah. And I always have thought that Dougal he does a lot of bad things and he's got a lot of bad motives, Mm -hmm. but I think he's, he's way more complex than just being the bad guy. He's, yes, he's, he's a very complex 
character. And that's where you start to see some of the, this is where you see some of those complexities. Yeah, exactly. Like, yes, you get the the little taste of it um, in the second episode. Um, and then you get to see him be a little more of, you know, the, the bad guy type. But then here it's, it's very, you know, very conflicting. And throughout the episode, Claire gets to see a lot of other bad guys that are way worse. Yes. That yeah. I always think what's so interesting is seeing him in contrast, like the garrison, well, the garrison commander in general, or the next episode, the title of that's the title of the next episode. If you didn't know, mm-hmm. um, is, a, is the spoiler most, per- spoiler alert. <laughs> is the most perfect example of that's when you think Dougal is a hero. Is yes. the garrison commander, which I, I get such a thrill of that. Like that's, that's, um, Obviously, that's for further discussion. We are, yeah, we are. but you know what I mean. Like, it depends who he's with. <laughs> it does. Yeah. No, it does. Are you making fun of me for my love of him again? <laughs> no, not the slightest. Um. Well, and I think too that, um, you know, even in this this part here with the women, you know, Claire's with the women who are walking the wall, and then we find mm-hmm. out that, you know, that one woman, her her baby, she hasn't oh, been able yeah. to, you know, make breast milk for the baby or the baby won't take the breast milk and teasing, now yeah. yeah now they have to do the give the goat they gave the goat to Dougal for the rent uh-huh. and I always thought that like if Claire had not been so freaking self-righteous about that uh-huh. he probably would have given the goat back one like million if she, one million percent. like if she had said you know calmly calmly like hey in here's respect, the situation Mm-hmm. Yes, because you see it later in the episode with the the folks that uh, the British had just, just come through. Yes, yeah, exactly. And he he like redistributes the wealth. I mean, he's like Dougal's a socialist man. Like, come yeah. on, <laughs> you can't say and, he doesn't care about those people. Like, he clearly does. But at the same time, he seems to prove it over and over again. If he had given in to this English woman that nobody knows. Mm-hmm. Who's throwing a fit and is acting drunk and yeah, it makes him, yeah, up, it making is. a scene, speaking up against the men. If he gave in to her, he would lose power and respect in yeah. that village. Which is absolutely so that's much what it, that's all that was how he 100%. gets stuff done. And that's all it was. That mm-hmm. that's what it was. If she had just like pulled him aside and said, "Hey, hey, Dougal, man, this this is a baby that's gonna go hungry tonight. Can we give? Can I'm we sure you could sneaky the goat back into you know. There's ways to right. do it. Not everybody's paying attention." He absolutely would. He yeah. absolutely would. Yeah. She would. He just needed to to, to save face. It's funny because when we we're you guys were just talking about it, I <laughs> I just had this mental image of like the town Facebook page, <laughs> and people people being like, you know, like Claire posting on it, like, can you believe <clears throat> that he wouldn't get that goat back? And like half of them were like. Calm down. Rent is French. They have to pay the rent. You don't know how we do things here, Sassanac. So okay. Yeah, absolutely. So mind your own business. What I love too is I when I was watching that scene, um, because um, how Angus is in that scene drives me absolutely insane. Uh, but the way and okay, and so obviously like that's not. I'm trying to move to the Dougal part, but. Uh, Duel's not happy that Claire la- that Claire um, escaped his uh, henchman's uh, eye, and <laughs> well, he's like, "Get up and shit walk for it." <laughs> Barely, no love, Netflix. Um, so he's upset that you know they couldn't hold down the fort and uh, giving him shit and stuff. But when he talks to her, he's totally calm. He like is angry for a second, and then you see him like take a breath or take a moment, and he's like, mm-hmm. "What's?" He says something like, "Um." what like what's the more meaning of this or, or something he asked her for some sort of exclamation ex- explana- oh my god explanation and he's so mature and ca- like and calm about it like yeah, literally yeah. compared to everybody else in that entire scene other than um the savior that uh comes in as well but yeah um yeah you can't you can't be telling me Dougal's this uh massive villain only villain he's uh not- monster people he's just not He's not unhinged. Like he's, he's the scary kind of, a little nutty. Like he's got oh, he sure. has, <laughs> not as scary as Galus, but I'm getting way ahead of ourselves. Um, <laughs> that's that's made scary. in hell. Yeah. Oh God. 
Um, however, comma. He so Dougal definitely has he has his priorities. He has yes. his cause. He has he has his list of things that he needs to accomplish. And Claire is in the freaking way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I would like to point out what we are saying here, though, <laughs> in Claire getting all self righteous and throwing a tantrum about the goat is in her trying to do the right thing. She messed it up for everybody yes. else. And that's for like, is that, does that feel like foreshadowing? <laughs> I was going to say, like, that sounds like her as a character. <laughs> this sounds like her <laughs> as a person. Of this <laughs> yeah, no, it's like, absolutely true. <laughs> so let's, let's just, let's call it, call a spade a spade. She mm-hmm. messed up. Yeah. yeah. Oh, absolutely. That was, that was not Dougal being cruel. That was her acting impulsively on things that she doesn't understand. Mm-hmm. Yep. And, you know, a little bit later in the episode, um, when Jamie goes to talk to her again, like, you know, he keeps trying to, like, give her these little, like, talking tos, and then he kind of washes his hands of her, and then, mm-hmm. you know, um, She's annoying. He's, he says, <laughs> he says you shouldn't He gets annoyed a- by her. <laughs> yeah, he says it's amazing. Should not It's like be- the first, kind of the first time. The first official time after he's got, like, the massive hard eyes. It's, it's Yeah. Well, it's like the first and only, but yeah, you know. exactly, exactly. It's so but strange. Like, he says you shouldn't be commenting on things that you don't know anything yes. about, mm-hmm. and that's so interesting to me. And you know, I don't want to get too much into to uh, parallels to today, but you know, th- it's a lot. It's very similar to some of the conversations that you see being had. Um, about like racial injustice and stuff today oh, yeah. is that like mm-hmm. you know you there's there's a place for you to put your nose in the business and there's a place for you to not right and you yeah. have to find that balance and that's that's exactly you know what's going on here and she's uh, she's she's looking at everything they're doing from this like english um 20th century perspective. Yeah. 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 Specific which she one. thinks is superior, which it just in some cases it's just not. It's just different. It, and she's so incensed that when they go to the pub that night and Dougal's giving his speech, um, you know, she obviously doesn't know much Gaelic or Gaelic, sorry. Um, <laughs> she obviously doesn't know much Gaelic, but um, I think if she'd had a little bit more of an open mind, she might have figured out what was actually going on sooner. A lot sooner and could have saved herself some trouble. I want to go back though. So I think I think it was Ness who said something who mentioned the, the savior in the scene with oh, yeah. the goat. That scene, man, is there's so much packed into that. So something something Beth just said made me think about this. So um I had a freaking thought. God dang it. <laughs> uh, savior. <laughs> savior. Oh, uh, Beth was don't, about, uh, don't, don't talk about things that you don't understand. Don't understand. You're like, keep, keep not it. Not entitled to. Uh, what was I going to say? Oh, I can't remember now. Okay. Ah, I, I got it. I got it. Okay. So. <laughs> bear Here's a part to cut. <laughs> bear. Nah. Bear with me. <laughs> so. Claire has, by the end of the series. So. I know we're going to, I'm just going to talk about every little freaking thing. So by the end of the series, not the episode, the series of books, Claire has been married a total of three times. Mm-hmm. Four, if you count Jamie the second time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but where her husbands have all seemed to go wrong is try to just tell her, don't do this. Oh yeah. Don't stick your nose in where it doesn't belong. Mm-hmm. Don't make a scene understand where you are you're a woman in this time blah 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 blah. the only one who hasn't actually done that though if you think about it is lord john he kind of let say ah got it so (laughs) jeremy foster made me think of him because you know as he should yeah as he should um but yeah so when they're when they're married there's that conversation that they have pretty sure they were laying naked in bed (laughs) i love that scene um where she's trying to explain to him it's the best where she's trying to explain to him that she and brianna are from the future and all this Mm. stuff and he does not believe her at all 
but he kind of <laughs> leads by example and this this is such a such a stretch i don't care he kind of leads by example on that on that front of don't make a scene when he says no i i don't believe you but I, i'm too much of a gentleman to act like this in public yeah, he yeah. says, I, I, I promise I'll act like I do or something like that. Right. Like, yeah. I'll go along with it if this is what makes you happy. <laughs> what a sweetheart. What a sweetheart. Well, and, and it's interesting because John has, out of all the characters, except maybe Colm, but um, has spent most of his life around very strong-willed women. <laughs> Oh yeah, that's true. That's a big one. Uh, Benedict, so many. Yeah, I mean, it's just uh, even Jamie like, had, yeah, Jamie had a little bit of about, time. No, it didn't last long. Even think about the his um the the character Ness Nessie, right? Yeah. Oh. Um, she's very strong willed, and they end up becoming very good friends. So very good friends. he he has a really good way of. Well, first of all, he's smart, <laughs> right. you know, but he, he also just has a very good way of, of, uh, handling, you know, that type of stuff. And, you know, Jamie, I'd argue, I mean, he, I believe his mother was very strong willed, but he mm-hmm. just didn't have all those years yeah, exactly, yeah. with yeah. her. He only saw her through a child. And then he left Jenny eyes. when he was a young teenager and all that stuff. So he had some of that too, but it wasn't like, as cons- probably not as consistent as he, when he was, a, when he was an adult. Which I think it would have significant uh, influence. Well, even as well, a yeah. kid with Jenny, though, so like the dynamic there is going to be very different. So yeah, that's yeah, true. Yeah. Ellen was a Mackenzie, so she would, she, yeah, she would have had a big old personality. Oh, for sure. But Jenny would too. However, comma, he's the heir now. Yeah. So there, even though she's older than him, there would be a little bit of deference in their yeah, his, interaction. His whatever his uh, whatever he says still goes right. So. A, well, and a, I think, maybe. I think too that because Jenny had to take on that role so young, yeah. she still had a lot of growing up to do as well. So it's mm-hmm, just, mm-hmm. it's just, a, it's just different. Yeah. Um, but yeah, John is, he training. is the, uh, he's the difficult woman whisperer. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I always think too, uh, that made me think of how, um, I, I feel like comparisons between John and Claire are, or should be obvious if they're not. But um, while I feel like John, it's so, it would be so easy for John to be in a, the same situation, uh, to behave similarly to Claire and thinking that he has, a, he has this impressive title. He has this um, kind of impressive military background. Um, uh, yeah, he's very educated and and worldly, travels all over the place, and yet he never once thinks that he's the smartest person in the room that should be telling everybody how to live their lives. Like, it's just not who he is. And so, and I, maybe it's just um, because, I always think maybe it's just, it is just because he had so many outsider experiences uh, through his life that he's just humble that way, but I just think it's interesting how... Um, there's kid like there's, how there's different characters maybe sprinkled through who I think could act that way, and um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, d- don't or choose not to, and he's one who very obviously very consistently, um, is pretty humble and just wants to be helpful. <laughs> and uh, so much of his survival depends on his discretion. Mm-hmm. Yes, absolutely. Well, and and that's kind of a key difference, though, right? Is that uh, he he has so much more situational awareness than Claire. Mm-hmm. Oh, God, yes. <laughs> oh, God, yes. I love that situational awareness. I'm going to use that. <laughs> and it's, I, I don't know. I just find it so fascinating with Claire because um, she does have so many ad- admirable traits yeah, sure. in a woman, right? But at the same time, I think sometimes you can get blinded by the those admirable traits and there are other traits that that you can have as a woman especially that help to um 
temper things a little bit. And I'm not saying like you women should be quiet or God, no. You know? I know I was, I was, I was worrying that I was kind of coming off saying the same thing. Like, like we're bad feminists and saying like, Oh, she should be quiet and obedient and listen to the men, which is not the case. But That's not what we're it's saying. just yeah, what that. Saying is she should be smarter about it. Yeah. And it's really yeah. from a smart, like, and from a respectful, obviously, um, just of everyone, despite whatever they are. And, um, that, just because she's a woman doesn't mean everybody's maybe against her. Like the reason they have um, doubts about her are valid, especially in their way of life. Like it's not because you're an outspoken woman necessarily. Like it doesn't just have to be about that. Well, and I think it comes back to that situational awareness, which now I think I'm kind kind of using the term loosely, but um, you know, it, one thing, Thing that is important, um, and and I think that a lot of intelligent people learn is you know to adjust yourself based on what's going on around you, mm-hmm. um, and and then again, this also kind of goes back to that whole "don't stick your nose where it doesn't belong." Like you know, taking a step back when you are not the expert Mm -hmm. um, and respecting other people's cultures and ways of life that she, she doesn't do that very much. And um, a big part of that you can see just because of the different centuries, right? Like, you know, Mm -hmm. she's used to the 20th century and now she's in the 18th and yeah, we can all sit here and say like, things sucked for women in the 18th century. Mm -hmm. But if you're, if you're going to be living there, you've got to find a way to adapt, adapt and Mm -hmm. be just as strong willed, but maybe not be so, um, I don't know. Well, because the conflict is not going to help you. I think that's yeah. the point. And I think of someone like yeah. Galus, who is a certified psych- psychopath, or obviously, <laughs> yeah, despite yeah. that, she, and obviously she, the, you've, there's revelations about her and things, but she found a way um, to I, possibly thrive, thrive in the way that she wanted to. She got pretty mm-hmm. much everything she wanted back in the 18th century. Like, she is not that dissimilar to Claire, and she figured out a way to get yep. what she wanted. And she leaned into the crazy, well, crazy. <laughs> the mysticism, like we, she leaned, she's, she really had leaned into that. Yep. I'm a witch. That's and, but, but once again, didn't get caught <laughs> until Claire came. Like, what's that about? <laughs> <laughs> Just brings the drama with her. Yeah. Um, uh, so, <laughs> oh boy, this is such a fun episode. I am really having a ball guys. Um, <laughs> So that evening after, so Claire's already upset as I try to steer us back around. So Claire, mm, Claire's like, already where upset. <laughs> where are we? We so Claire's pissed. Um, right. She's pissed at Dougal. She goes to this meeting because now Dougal won't let her out of his sight. She goes to this meeting at night, um, behind locked doors, and he's giving this big impassioned speech in Gaelic. And then he rips Jamie's shirt Ugh, to show his back. And I did not realize, like, I have strong feelings about this and I am going to talk about them <laughs> today. But I did not realize as I was rewatching how visceral my reaction to this is now. Yeah, it's it's absolutely. Um, I don't I don't know if. I necessarily have a more visceral reaction than I have before, but I mean, probably a little bit because I've just thought so much more over time about the way that Jamie was groomed by Dougal, oh um, that it just, you know, it, it's just, it's awful. Yeah. And I think this is a, like the prime example, or maybe, maybe the most probably recent, um, uh, oh, um, um, all-encompassing kind of example of his, like, what you might, might say is villainy. Because he mm-hmm. um, he has his priorities. His priorities mm-hmm. are um, what he chooses and what his um, upbringing and his uh, job kind of uh, demand of him, which is, um, ver- which is very demanding 
and very, he's, he has a lot of responsibility. Is to, he's responsible for a lot of people, like including his brother, the Laird, because of his situation. And um, he does not uh, find much issue with um, doing uh, just about whatever he needs to do to, uh, yeah, make the things happen that he he thinks are the best for Scotland, are the best for. Um, the Mackenzie clan for his family, yeah. his tenants, um, et cetera. And um, he, while I, maybe unknowingly, I'm not entirely sure. I don't know if he will ever really know. Um, takes these people who are usually family members of his in some way, shape or form. And um, uses them, takes care of them to, to usually takes care of them to, to the best of his ability to start. To the point where they trust him and rely on him. And uh, then uh, believes that they... Basically, in uh, trade-off of that, he believes that they owe him whatever he desires. Whatever he needs of them. Um, so, uh, he says later on to Jimmy in the episode, you... Fergus. Um, hi, Fergus. Um, you uh, swore an oath of fealty to the Mackenzie clan. And so I can do whatever I want with your back. I can do whatever I want with your shirt. You, I own you. I own you. And he doesn't say it, but I always feel like it's implied when he talks to Jamie that I took you on as a six, whatever, 16 year old or whatever it was. I taught you how to, uh, I, t- I took you under my wing after your father, or no, his father was still alive. No, but after his, um, or when he um, got back from school, oh my god, I'm getting my lineage and thing all all uh, all screwed up. But he t- he takes him under his wing. He um uh yeah te- teaches him everything he, he needs to know to be a big strong Scottish Highlander. And um uh and and you owe me. You owe me this um. This, this thing that you have that will get these people to do the thing that is right for Scotland. And because it's like, the ends justify the means and um, his Jacobite cause is uh, as, as valid as any possible thing could be. So, Yeah. So, and it's I, and it's not just the you owe me, it's I own you. Yeah. And yeah. there's yeah. So when when I when I say that Dougal and Column too, I'll save Column. I'll I'll rip him up a new one for another day. His but, his, his stuff is revealed uh, later on. <laughs> so Dougal and Column have both groomed Jamie since he was a teenager. That his worth as a person is dependent entirely on what if his body he is willing to sacrifice? What if his uh-huh. body, his person, he is willing to sacrifice? And that really is so apparent when he rips the, sh- when he rips Jamie's shirt. And like, this is, this is a personal private thing. Like this is not something he is comfortable uh-huh. sharing about himself because of all of the shame and everything that is, everything that's wrapped up in his scars, Uh he does not want to share that with people. Like he likes to keep some manner of privacy for his own feelings, his own experiences. And for the love of God, like it's his freaking body. Like Uh he has no bodily autonomy. And that Uh -uh. is such a theme in this whole damn series. He has zero bodily autonomy. Dougal has stripped it. Blackjack strips it later. Claire strips it later. Like he has been absolutely. Oh, I'm getting incensed. <sighs> and I think it stems because he is a soldier. So it's like, yeah, your body belongs to your country now. And then Dougal obviously takes it on very personally. Like, but at the oh, same I'm for the time, country, so your body's mine. But at the same time, like that's insane. It's absolutely insane and it's absolutely incorrect. It is oh for sure terrible. It, it, it was a terrible take then. It's a terrible take now. Like it just, I got I get so mad on Jamie's behalf for this crap because he's just not allowed to be a person. He is not allowed to be his own person because his body doesn't belong to him, and that is the message he has been he has been told since he was a kid. 
Yeah, I was going to say, I think it goes back even before, you know, he was a soldier or anything like that. Because when you think about the Duke of Sandringham and, you know, we don't, we don't hear as much of it in the, um, in the, in the series as we see in the books, but, you know, he was, uh, he was groomed by the Duke of Sandringham and his uncles, didn't encouraged they, it, yeah. they, they encouraged, encouraged it. it they didn't just to not the protect point, him they encouraged it mm-hmm. to the point where he had to make himself sick mm-hmm. in order to protect his own body he was like That's 15 almost... 16 at the time he poisoned yeah. himself yeah, yeah. he was afraid he was going to be sexually assaulted by the duke of sandringham yeah. and nobody nobody would would help him and it you know when you think about that where he knew at that age that he's the only one who could protect himself mm-hmm. from that. Um, and then you think about um, later with, with Blackjack Randall first, um, when Blackjack makes him the offer when he's in prison, um, yeah. it, th- the first time when he says, you know, either, you know, give me your body or I'm going to flog you again. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um you know, he, Jamie knows like nobody is going to to save him but himself. So he again he sacrifices his body and he he deliberately puts himself in pain mm-hmm. to to avoid being Dis- yeah, violated. Yeah, yeah, and, right. Yeah, exactly. And then and then of course later on again with Black Jack Randall, you know. It, it's it's just you know even worse and he again he knows nobody's coming for him nobody's going to be able to help him um so he has to try to just um he he's he's utterly alone in protecting yeah absolutely and And from from violation and assault and that's the message he has his entire life Mm -hmm. and this expectation Absolutely. And this this expectation that if mm-hmm. he is going like it it has to be completely on him. But at the same time, if he refuses, if he does if he takes steps to take himself out of these situations, he is going to disappoint his uncles. He is going to let somebody down. He is going to diminish his own worth as a person because it is yeah, worth as a person is tied. Originally and all that. Yes. Mm. Well, and, and and there's also this idea. I'm about to I'm about to pop. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Pop off, <laughs> queen. There is this idea that because he's six foot four, he's yeah, huge, exactly. he's yeah. muscular, he's all beefy, that he can't be victimized mm-hmm. by people who are more powerful than him. And that is mm-hmm. not how it fucking works. That is not if, how it works. If Wentworth prison and um oh I used to know the name of the last episode, now I'm forgetting. Uh if those two episodes don't show you that um someone smaller than Jamie can traumatize and like traumatize him to the point where he never gets over it for the rest of his life and um, is it has to um, give himself up in a way that like he never forgives himself for then I don't know what show you're watching <laughs> like yeah it's, it's just like it's so it's proven so heavily in the end of season one and I've seen the end of book one and yet mm-hmm. people still have these same notions about him rather in the story or readers um throughout you know till book nine i'm taking deep um, breath now <laughs> well good job I'm and waiting. not to go too far off topic but uh pan you and i were talking about this in the last episode about when jamie meets john he doesn't know what to do with him. And yes. I think this is a big part of it because even when John reaches out and puts his hand on Jamie, mm-hmm. when Jamie's like, get your hand off me, like John immediately does. And mm-hmm. then like mm-hmm. never tries to like make a pass at him or anything never ever again. again. Yeah, and Jamie's like, he, he doesn't even know what to do with himself because somebody's actually letting him have autonomy over his own body and Mm -hmm. he's like Mm -hmm. i I don't know what like how to do that (laughs) he he never once expects john to um 
respect his boundaries and yet that's all no. that john does that's all that john does and it and yet he's still and then so what jay what does jamie do he creates chaos to then turn around yep. john and be like wah, 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 you did this you did that when he did nothing he's usually like a, such a damaged man poor guy damaged. but mm-hmm. i like i think i think i said this last episode that even john touching his hand in ours mirror that was not a that wasn't a request it was an offer yes absolutely and i don't know that jamie realized that until much much later i think he did eventually figure it out but i think it took him a few years yeah well and and even if maybe he has trouble um accepting it he does know it he's not stupid enough not to know it and you're one of your favorite uh, things to say pan is they're two of like the dumbest smart men ever oh they're so Mm -hmm. dumb so dumb for being so (laughs) smart and so educated but again oh god something we talked about again yeah, last pan and i talked about last episode too you know it's so so john lets jamie have autonomy over his body mm-hmm. and jamie's so freaking mixed up about this that he goes ahead and gets himself in so much trouble mm-hmm. that john is forced to flog him oh God, so it's yeah. like it's so again it's like <laughs> He's, he he doesn't even know what to do with this autonomy, so he puts himself in a position yeah. where he, he has to give it up. Himself. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he like, has, yeah, like I said, he creates, creates the chaos. Uh, that, um, it's a repetition of his past traumas. Yeah. Oh. Mm-hmm. Dummy. Oh, but he, so dumb. Sorry to bring it back to Dougal, but I will. So, no, we um, need to bring it back to Dougal. <laughs> <laughs> but I, it was so interesting. I just this just popped in my head as you're talking about Jamie's bodily autonomy. Um, but I, uh, I, the detail that Dougal um, fathered Colum's child uh, because he couldn't uh, produce an heir. And that was confirmed, right? Am I? I don't think, yeah, I think it, was, it, it was confirmed. Right? It comes yeah. out later. I think it is that season two. Is it? Or I've later in this season? season one. So, I don't, I've seen it once. I'm not the <laughs> Anyways, authority on this one. Went, but um <laughs> oh no it's in season one okay yeah that's what i thought yeah he's like i assured when... your bloodline yeah yeah yes, yes when they have the fight that's right so it is a few episodes from now sorry but um uh but they do but there is that awkwardness at the mm-hmm. um head table in what is it? uh the way out or something 102 uh, i think oh there yeah, you go two. um so it's you know it's it's sprinkled in for quite a few episodes um and Dougal being the second son of a Laird. Um, like Jamie himself, there's lots of parallels there that I could go into, but I won't. Um, but mm. he, so he's, okay, so I'll try to make this quick. But, so he uh, has grown up knowing he's the second son, knowing he's bigger and stronger and capable of more physically than Colm, just because of reality. Um, not ju- there's no judgment there, it's just real- medical realities. Um, he, uh, and so, um, I'm sure he's got a lot of complexes about, like, oh, I should be layered, and, um, he's obviously very upset with Jamie, um, thinking that he even has the, um, idea of becoming, um, leader of Clan Mackenzie, and here, he's in the, next thing you know, he's in this situation, uh, where, his brother is having trouble producing an heir, and he's the laird, and he needs to, and it's, it will bring shame onto their entire clan. And so he, and who knows how this conversation went? We don't know. I'm just speculating, but so he rather is um, demanded. Uh, his his um, his body is demanded. His uh, will is demanded. His, like his presence is demanded uh, to help with this. Um, issue that his brother's having, that his clan is having, that would have dastardly kind of uh, results, um, long term and on a big, big scale for their kind of whole world. So I just keep, I, so I can't help but think like he either offered himself up to produce a child that he that would never know, or would, yeah, most likely would never know, or that he would never be able to claim as his own. Ah, um, parallels, ah. right? So I'm telling you, I could go on and on, but I'm thinking more as I say it. Um, and he that he also that he has to be um, not similar to Jamie, but not entirely, but that he grows up, that he watches the son of his, um, 
grow up and become a laird, <laughs> something that he never got to do. Um, <laughs> so hold it, and then, hold it in, Beth. Hold it in. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm trying to make this quick, but it's not happening. Um, so he. He was so yeah so sorry I can't seem to get my point straight across that what I'm trying to say which is that Colin Mather said you have to do this you don't have a choice because we have a sim- one of our similar genetic makeup so uh, this is my best option you owe me this because I am your Laird um and not to mention oh my god I could go on and on about the things that um Dougal has to make up for because of Colin's. Like, the things that he does. Yeah. Um, when, when it's like he's got his own freaking place that he lives with his wife that he never sees and his daughters that he never sees. You know what I mean? He's, he, yeah. does, he has a life that is not his own. And he, he lives the life of a pseudo-laird because he um, chooses to, because he wants to, because I think he wants that life. But then he doesn't have a choice but to participate in, participate in because of his values. Um... But also, also, I don't think Colin would give him a choice because we will find out, I think we have already a bit, find out the kind of person that Colin is, which is mm -hmm. very uh, calculating. And um, who knows? He's the older brother. He may have taught Dougal from a young age how to manipulate people. So I hope that, I hope I actually said what I wanted to say, but (laughs) there you go. (laughs) He said a lot of good stuff. Uh, But bodily autonomy, he's inflicting this on Jamie, and yet he has the same, he has a similar issue. It is, ooh, I, mm. I'm not saying it's, and he's a perpetrator who then, who, who passes on the trauma. It is, yeah. Trauma. There you go. Um, not that this is a, a, an excuse oh. for him or apologize, or like trying to apologize for him. That's not that. I'm just saying. You can apologize um, to, about him for, or for him for other things. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, exactly. But that, I'm not surprised that he does not, um, that he would do that, uh, that he would not make a peep about someone else, call him whoever it might be, who maybe when he was young, when he was Jamie's age, the war chief at the time, doing that to him. He does not think that he was not raised to believe that there's anything wrong with that. Or that he shouldn't do that for his clan and his country. It's insane! Absolutely correct. Oh my god. I really okay. You said some stuff about parallels and similar mm-hmm. lives, and I really want to get into this, mm-hmm. but I have to point out this half hour has flown by. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's correct. Even by our standards, this half hour is we may we we may have blown it just a tiny bit. Mm-hmm. Should we just go ahead? Let's go ahead and call this a two parter. <laughs> yes, love it. Absolutely. Love it so much. Let's call we it. We told you there was tons of content in this episode. Oh, and we all have lots and lots of feelings. Mm-hmm. Um, let's call this a two-parter. Let's stop here, and we will come back to it on the next one, um, because there's so much to talk about. So let's mm-hmm. let's stop here, and we will come back. I agree. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, Ness. I can't wait Thanks. to finish this conversation with you. Me too. Let's oh, this back. has been fun. Let's All come right. Back. Yeah, this Let's is awesome. Do it. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for tuning in and listening again. Um, <laughs> no idea how many people are going to be listening at this point. Oh, I was going to say, if you're still here, we're still here. We're still surprised, and we still appreciate if this you. Long-winded rant hasn't turned you off completely. <laughs> and or my we're not done. Apology, which I will not apologize for. We're just going to bookmark it, and we will finish this rant shortly. <laughs> Bye, everyone. <laughs> Bye. This podcast is not affiliated with Outlander, Sony, Stars, and definitely 100% not with Diana Gabaldon. All opinions expressed are our own, and we may not even believe them ourselves. In fact, nothing in this podcast should be taken seriously as a general rule. We may not even be real people. Does this podcast even exist? This podcast is not suitable for children, immature adults, homophobes, anyone who takes fandom too seriously, people who don't understand that the characters aren't real, people with sticks up their ass, people who hate fun, and people who have no sense of humor. Do not try any of these hot takes at home. We are professionals.
The FDA has not approved this podcast for human consumption. Side effects may include nausea, vomiting, the urge to send us anonymous homophobic hate, ringing in your ears, and constipation. If you experience any of these side effects, ask your doctor if dying mad about it is right for you. If you know us in real life, no, you don't.